So hi, uh, welcome, I'm glad to see you all. We're gonna get through a few little boring things first. My name is John, um, that's actually a picture of me. Uh, so if you see me in the hall, look for the scary blue guy. And uh, my heterosexual life mate here is Aaron. Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these, uh, these slides will be available online, so if you need to stalk us via the internet, you can find all that information there. We work for a company called AdReady, uh, and we love them because they pay us to come and do this. So thank you very much, AdReady. Uh, if you need cheesy display ads, we have got you covered. Come see us. Uh, we're from Seattle, where it is very rainy, and we all wear flannel shirts, and we drink bad coffee and sometimes good coffee, and we hang out with terrifying, angry, ruby people. Hello, Ryan. Nice to see you. So we're here today to talk about two different languages, two very, very different languages. Uh, the first of which is JavaScript. And I'm gonna do just a little bit of a JavaScript history for you, um, because some of you may not know it. Um, JavaScript was invented by a guy at Netscape, and it looks like a C language or a Java language, but it really has a very, very different inheritance. It came from Scheme and Self, and just happened to get a little bit of Java-ish, C-ish, uh, syntactic sugar on top to, uh, to pay the bills. And just a few quick things about JavaScript so we're all on the same page. JavaScript objects are really open. They're just like Ruby hashes. It's just a bag of crap. And you can get to it, that's a technical term. Um, you can get to it by indexing in just like we do on a Ruby hash. You can also get to it through a dot syntax which looks very similar to method invocation. Uh, JavaScript functions themselves are very free. They're kind of similar to Ruby lambdas. You can create them outside of any class. You can call them directly by their name, but you can also attach them to objects. And if you call a JavaScript function that's attached to an object, you have a this pointer, just like this in, or just like self in Ruby. JavaScript also doesn't have any classes per se. You can create a prototype of something so that anytime you create a new instance of it, you have similar methods to what was there before, um, but you don't really have inheritance itself. So enough about that, moreover. Let me help you care. We care because it is everywhere. There are JavaScript interpreters on your freaking phone, on every browser you have. It's got the greatest penetration of any language ever. There's JavaScript here. The other language we're gonna talk about, <laughs> the other language we're gonna talk about today is Ruby. All of you know all about Ruby, so I'm not gonna go through the summaries of where it came from or who wrote it or anything like that. <laughs> because I'm sure you know that already because you're a big honking group of Ruby nerds. So, why do we actually care about these two languages together? Because we love the internet. Specifically, we love the World Wide Web, which is what most of us in this room probably do for a living. And the really interesting thing about JavaScript and Ruby is that we use them both constantly. We use them every day. And they have nothing in common. When we do internet site development, we use Ruby on the server side. We use JavaScript on the client side. We use Prototype, we use Rails, we use Mer, we use jQuery but we don't really use them together. We do stuff on the server, we wad it up into a little bundle, and we toss it over to the client and forget about it. Which is cool, I mean, it's obviously worked for us, but we'd really like something a lot better. Some of the problems with JavaScript include the fact that the only runtime that we have to mess with is the one that's built into the browser. We can't do anything else. And with that, I'm going to high five in my partner, Aaron Patterson. Hello. Thank you. Um, JavaScript is tightly coupled to your browser. Whenever you want to do any sort of um, JavaScript testing, you have to run it in your browser. Um, you, it's very difficult to test one thing without dragging along the other. So For the purposes of this presentation, pictures of rhinos will represent JavaScript. Yes. Carry on. That's true. And purple arrows mean type coupling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, but the awesome thing is that uh, this comes with a sweet standard library of uh, being able to modify DOM trees. What else can it do? That's it. Great. <laughs> it also comes with um, excellent code packaging systems such as uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's got it's got a great command line interface for testing f with test frameworks, like, um, I, I forgot that one too. Oh, I love that one. <laughs> um, 
continuous integration systems. We right, right? Like, uh, or or just hit refresh, right? <laughs> So, anyway, everything depends on the browser. That's totally lame. <laughs> lame. We want something different. We want to be able to do all this stuff without our runtime having to be part of the browser. We want to be able to do our testing outside the browser. We want to be able to load a freaking file if we need to. We want to be able to extend things easily if we're experimenting with new libraries and stuff like that. And especially, we want to be able to mess with the language and the runtime without having to load 30 megs of Firefox, Firebug, and a partridge in a pear tree. So we wrote something called Johnson. <clears throat> this is not a juvenile penis joke. This is a penis joke made by grown men. <laughs> Thank you. So the point of Johnson is to bridge this huge divide between these two very, very different languages. And we want to do it in both directions. We want you to be able to use your JavaScript in your Ruby, uh, whether it's in big segments or in little segments. If you want to take a JavaScript function and use it as a Lambda, you should be able to. And in JavaScript, if you want to, you should be able to call Ruby methods. You should be able to use Ruby objects. You should be able to toss things back and forth and not have to worry about which language they're implemented in. I know. So really, we wanted to take these two languages and make them fall in love. We wanted to make them hug. We wanted to let them happily work together. And uh, when we originally started this, we were doing it for fun, to see if we could do something ridiculous. But the really nice thing about it is that it's turned out that we found some really good pragmatic excuses for doing this. And uh, one of the most important ones is working with the internet. Now. We all use the internet, right? I know you do. Raise your hand if you love the internet. That's right. Yeah, Web 2.0. Ryan Davis, you're a hater. <laughs> I've caught you using the internet. Yes, I have. Anyway, um, we've all heard of Web 2.0, which uses um, AJAX. And um, you know, most websites are dynamic. They use this. We all know what it stands for. Um, <laughs> Put your mic a little closer to your mouth. Ah. So uh, screen scraping, sometimes we need to screen scrape these particular sites. Um, and it's, it's not just for douchebags, truly. Sometimes you need an automated way of interacting with a website that doesn't have an API. And um, you just can't do that when things are, you know, Ajax is going on. Now, the internets are full of this JavaScript and what do we do about that? We already have a great screen scraping tool called Mechanize. Um, but Not it's that we're got, biased or anything. <laughs> it's got a huge down, downfall. For example, we have this particular uh, website that's using some of this um, Aaron JavaScript, Aaron's Exchange, and uh, manipulating the DOM. So let's say we tried to screen scrape that. Uh, the, we would get the wrong results in Mechanize, which is unfortunate. Um, but if we were to integrate Johnson, we would actually get the right results. Um, and with that, I'm going to show an example of using the Johnson shell. One quick note on, on Mechanize. What we've done there is what Mechanize normally does is it makes a request, it turns the HTML into a DOM tree, and then lets you run XPath or CSS selectors against it. What we've done with Johnson is we actually find all the script tags and the links to, uh, to JavaScript files and everything. We load them in and we run the JavaScript runtime right along with the page so that if there's stuff in there that mucks with the DOM, it gets executed on time. If you have stuff that messes with CSS uh, classes, that gets applied as well, which makes it way easier to deal with that sort of dynamic stuff. So using the Johnson shell, um, for example, it's very similar to IRB except that you have two different languages. You get to deal with JavaScript and deal with uh, Ruby. You can see up here JS stands for JavaScript. Um, We're manipulating JavaScript right now, calling alert, which unfortunately actually isn't defined in JavaScript at all. It's defined in the browser, so you're going to get an error. Um, and 
I've decided for this slide that we're going to implement it. So we switch over to Ruby with the RB command and we can access the JavaScript runtime via the JS variable and it's treated just like a hash. We can toss stuff into it. So uh, we're gonna define the alert function in Ruby but in the JavaScript runtime. So we'll assign a lambda to it. Uh, it gets marshaled over. We switch back over to the JavaScript shell, run hello world, it works. Everybody is happy. Um, Magic. It's magic. We might also want to iterate. So in JavaScript, we define an iterator, which this one multiplies x by itself, or x, some math thing, I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> so we head back over into our uh, Ruby shell, pull out the iterator, um, and then use it just like a proc. So really, it works just like Ruby, and you have no idea. So. How do we accomplish this awesome stuff? How do we accomplish all this awesome stuff? Well, John, I'll tell you. Via Johnson proxies. Now, an important thing about Johnson proxies is, you know, everything is an object. In Ruby, everything is an object. In JavaScript, everything can be an object. And we take advantage of this. Unfortunately, um, we have two objects, a Ruby object and a JavaScript object, and when they send messages, they can't understand each other. They speak different languages. So we need some way of um, making them look like one another. So we need to be able to trick a Ruby object into thinking that a JavaScript object is a Ruby object. And we need to trick a JavaScript object into thinking that a Ruby object is a uh, I'm confusing myself. <laughs> anyway, Johnson takes care of this. Johnson sits on the border of the two, language, two languages handing out cloaks. So say this uh, Ruby object wants to head over into JavaScript country, it needs to consult with um, Johnson and receive its plus nine um, cape of invisibility and vice versa. If JavaScript wants to head over into Ruby country, it needs to do that. So. You know, here we have a JavaScript object in the Ruby country, and they speak the same language. Or vice versa. JavaScript, uh, Ruby object over in JavaScript country speaking JavaScript. You tagging me in? Yes, I'm tagging you in. I'm unprepared for this section. Okay, so just a quick example of that. If we create a new object in Ruby, we can toss it over the, the boundary of the language over into JavaScript by binding it to a global variable in the runtime. Um, as soon as we get there, it's totally available and we can mess with it just like we can mess with any open JavaScript. Uh, we can add a new variable to it that contains a string. We can add a new function to it that's attached. And all of that stuff will work in JavaScript just like we would want it to work. The interesting thing is, is all of that stuff will now work in Ruby as well. It's uh, it's making changes to the classes, or the objects in this case, transparently. It's defining singleton methods for you on the Ruby side, so if you mess with an object, no matter which language you're in at the time, it'll take care of it for you. Now there are a couple places where things are a little more complicated. Uh, with regular expressions, we want it to be uh, as, as unsurprising as possible. We don't want to take Ruby regexes across the border and uh, and proxy to them because they won't work right in any of the, the JavaScript methods. So with a few things like regular expressions, we actually will uh, we'll convert them by value. We'll take your regex in Ruby, we'll parse it, and we'll create a JavaScript regex out of it so that it'll work like you expect. We also, if you move strings across the, uh, the language boundary, we do those by reference, or excuse me, by value because JavaScript strings are immutable and Ruby strings are not, which confuses SpiderMonkey to no end. So, a quick example here just of attaching the functions again. Pull it across, bring it in, attach a function, back over in Ruby, and it works fine. That's for a singleton method on a single instance. You can also, and I'm not sure why you'd use this, but I thought it was awesome, you can actually mess with the prototype of a Ruby object in, uh, in JavaScript. So if you can, you want to attach a method that's going to be available on all strings in Ruby, just like you can do this in JavaScript, 
uh, you can do it to Ruby objects. We can attach this method called embiggen. We'll put it on the prototype of the Ruby object. If we head over to Ruby, any new instance of the class will have it just like we would expect from JavaScript methods. Now, one of the really scary things about this is that we can have these classes now that are implemented half in one language and half in the other and have no idea which language they're implemented in, which is really scary from one perspective, but when we're doing things like making JavaScript libraries run on the server side, it's really nice to be able to decorate Ruby objects with some of the stuff that JavaScript expects. Boy, John, this sounds hard. This was hard, Aaron. <laughs> Let me tell you about some of the things that made it hard. <laughs> That's what she said. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, folks. I'll be here all week. <laughs> this was really, really, really hard. So what we've actually done is taken the spider monkey runtime itself and embedded it as a C extension in Ruby, which means, especially with as transparent as we want to make these things, we have to orchestrate between two very, very different garbage collection mechanisms. So what we end up doing is keeping reference counts on both sides such that if you GC a Ruby object and there are still references to its proxy in JavaScript, that it doesn't get garbage collected in either place and vice versa. Uh, this isn't very interesting, but it took me so long that I want to punish you by making you listen to me talk about it so that I can feel better. The other thing that was really difficult was threading. Um, which is weird because we really don't have an API in the browser for doing multi-threaded work in JavaScript. You can do async stuff, but it kind of fakes it. But SpiderMonkey itself is thread safe underneath. <clears throat> and even though there are no threading things there, it expects to be dealing with native OS threads. Uh, Ruby, as you may have noticed, doesn't have any of those right now. So what we've had to do is make sure that when you go across thread boundaries in Ruby, that we save the state of the interpreter and make sure that it's valid no matter what thread you're on. Once again, this is boring, but it hurt me to do, so you have to listen to me talk about it. So we, we ran into this because uh, since we expose everything in Ruby to JavaScript, you can also do threaded programming in JavaScript just using Ruby threads. Which is yeah, you can pass thread new a, a JavaScript function, which is cool until it crashes the world. So some of you look a little bit dubious. And uh, so to, to help you with that, I'm going to bring on my friend Aaron Patterson. You may have met him before. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know what you may be saying. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> Case in point. For example, here is a Fibonacci sequence, which uh, we at AdReady do all the time. We do a lot of Fibonacci. Yeah. A lot of Fibonacci sequencing. It's, you wouldn't believe how many Fibonacci numbers you need to do to make online advertising happen. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's the Fibonacci sequence defined in Ruby. And here is the Fibonacci sequence defined in JavaScript in Ruby. And um, here is the Fibonacci sequence defined in a Ruby class in JavaScript in Ruby. Ooh. Bring it back, dude. Bring it back. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so we have def fib, which returns Fibonacci sequence, purely Ruby implementation. Second fib returns a Fibonacci sequence, but implemented in JavaScript. And the clients of this class have no idea with how either of these methods are implemented. So you can see from this slide here, this test case, that they actually return the same number, and it works, it works just fine. Now, one question you may be asking yourself is, which one is faster? And we will let you figure that out for yourself. It's a very interesting result. JavaScript is pretty thin on standard library stuff, as you may have noticed from earlier. So we've added a few little helpers to help you out when you're hacking with Johnson. The first of which is we've added a JavaScript aware require to Johnson. You can use this from inside your JavaScript. It uses the exact same load path as Ruby. So you can bundle JavaScript along with your gems if you're doing a multi-language project, especially one where maybe you are testing JavaScript on the server side but using it on the client side. Uh, you can also bundle pure JavaScript as gems if you want. I don't know why you would do that, but I think that'd be super cool if you did. Um, everything is available through a top-level constant called Ruby. We let you get to anything you want through there, whether it's a kernel method or one of your nested classes or anything else. Uh, so you don't have to require anything. You don't have to explicitly import anything. It's just there. 
The one other feature that we had to add because there's no concept of it in JavaScript is a way to do symbols. And originally we did it so that any string that came across the boundary from JavaScript to Ruby that started with a colon turned into a symbol. And that turned out really badly. <laughs> So um, we have explicit helpers to help you symbolize strings. Once you've done that, they traverse across the barrier. They work just fine. Your symbols work in both places. They are singletons in JavaScript, so if you're working with it, every time you get it, you'll get the exact same reference. The one other thing that we did add was under under file, which is handy on the server side, but pointless on the browser. So we've shown you a few excuses that we had for actually doing this. and. Uh, I think I'm going to have Aaron show you some of the more ridiculous things that we've been able to do with it, which are way more fun than screen scraping with Mechanize. Yes. So, Johnson, the not so practical. Um, since we let you access anything in Ruby, we let you have database access in JavaScript. So, uh, for example, we may be inside of a Rails project like this. I'm, I'm just inside some random Rails project with a user model. I fire up my uh, interactive Johnson and switch to the... <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> switch to the Ruby shell and then uh, require the environment. So we have our Rails environment, um, require our user model, so we have access to user, uh, switch back over into JavaScript, and then do a find on users. And you can see we're using Johnson Symbolize right there, so find all users, and we have just accomplished database access in JavaScript. <coughs> who needs Ruby? Hmm? I said, who needs Ruby? Who does need Ruby? JavaScript does everything you need. <laughs> so we can iterate over each of those users and output the name. So we have Aaron Patterson, who is an internet, internet expert, and John Barnett, who is a web and architect. <laughs> so symbolize all. Um, we also have a thing called EJS, or um, Enterprise Job. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what does it stand for? It's embedded JavaScript. Ah, embedded JavaScript, not enterprise. Hmm, okay. <laughs> so given a, say, Rails controller here that just finds some users, uh, we can write our view in JavaScript. So let's say we have um, index.html.ejs. Um, you can see that this section here in red is actually implemented in JavaScript, and you might have noticed that special variable at dot. Um, we define at dot, and that contains all of your um, instance variables inside of your Rails controller. We could have defined them all at the top level, but we didn't want to pollute your JavaScript namespace, so they're all stuffed into at dot users. And we, we did this because we thought it was ridiculous, and then realized kind of accidentally that there really is a point to doing this sometimes. One of the nice things is if you've got a page where you're going to render it once and then you're going to update it a ton via Ajax, it's really nice to have this because you use this to render on the server side and then you ship the entire template over to the client side. The templatizing code runs just as well in the browser as it runs anywhere else. And then you can use the same template to render results from, say, a JSON result set that you get via Aaron's JavaScript Internet Exchange or yes. whatever that's called. Ajax. All you have to do is implement the at object and you have all the context that you need. So that plugin is available to you in uh, the Johnson Jam under lib rails in it. And if you have Rails 2.0 because it's in this magic directory, you use the, what, what is it? Gem requirement? The gem plugin stuff. Yeah, yeah, gem plugin stuff so it'll automatically get loaded. Um, what other thing that I've added is breakpoints. So, I allow you to define breakpoints in Johnson. So let's say we have some particular JavaScript. We start up our runtime. Uh, we compile a script before running it. And notice the name there, my script. You actually have to compile the script and then give it a name and then tell the runtime, hey, I want to break in my script on line three. And whenever the runtime hits that particular breakpoint, it'll execute the block that you've given it. And you can do anything you want to inside the block. The runtime is frozen such that you can access any variables inside the runtime and inspect things. So this is nice. So you can do kind of JavaScript debugging and not have to do it in a browser or you know, something more heavier. 
So then evaluate your compiled script and it will actually execute your breakpoints and it looks something like this. So uh, you can see i equals zero and x equals zero and that is because back here at the breakpoint, um, the breakpoint gets executed before the line is actually evaluated. So it'll execute your breakpoint, then evaluate the line. Uh, another thing that we've done, this is, this is very, very important to us. This is very, very useful. Very useful in the uh, Johnson world. HotRuby.js. Has anyone here heard of, heard of this? One per, okay, three, four, all right. HotRuby.js um, is a Ruby 1.9 bytecode interpreter written in JavaScript. So we you can- We have no idea why. Yeah. <laughs> You can run Ruby 1.9 bytecode in JavaScript. So, uh, for example, let's say we have some Ruby code, puts hello world. Another thing that we do in online advertising a lot. Constantly. A lot. Puts hello world. <laughs> this is actually more important than Fibonacci sequence, believe it or not. Um, this is the bytecode for it. Um, Yuck. That's lovely. Yeah. So we can actually execute that. So we'll do a, you know, fire up our interactive Johnson, um, require hot Ruby, do a new hot Ruby, um, evaluate that bytecode, and you can see in red there that hello world was actually executed. Let me leave it. Um, this means that we're able to run Ruby on JavaScript on Ruby on Rails. <laughs> very important, very important. One more thing. JavaScript parse tree. Uh, we give you access to the JavaScript parse tree. And this is the real parse tree. This is the parse tree that SpiderMonkey uses. So it's not our own, you know, home cooked parse tree. This is actually pulled straight out of SpiderMonkey. Um, this is what the API looks like. You parse some JavaScript and it gives you back an AST. And you can do stuff with the AST. Um, for example, you can get directed graphs out of the AST so you can, it outputs it as dots files so you can look at it as a dot file. Um, it gives you a sex piece so you can read it easily. Uh, the, the AST implements in each method so that you can walk every node in your AST. And we also provide a 2JS method so you can take your AST and turn it back into JavaScript. So given the earlier tree, uh, we may want to walk every node and look for name nodes whose values are foo and change those name nodes to hello. And then we can output that JavaScript. So this is just an example, but you can obviously do much more complicated things. Yeah, we think we have enough there that it's pretty easy to write preprocessors or macros for JavaScript or even some basic AOP stuff. Um, we haven't written the libraries for it, but we would love it if somebody else would. <laughs> so, and since you can get access to anything inside of Ruby from JavaScript, JavaScript gets access to its own parser. So you can parse yourself, manipulate yourself, turn yourself into JavaScript, and then evaluate yourself. Yeah, right? <laughs> we know, know you've all been pining for that in the browser for years, so yes. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, testing. There we go. So we're good to go on 1.0. We're going to release it either tonight or tomorrow. Um, it does OK. It, uh, it runs on 1.86 only right now because we're terrified of 1.9. Um, it's on Unix. We're going to do a Windows build if anybody really wants one. It's, it's doing OK. It's pretty hard to crash these days, but we're not running it in any really heavy load, multi-threaded environments. We would be delighted if you did because um, we really want to make it a lot more solid. Um, just a few people that we want to thank before we go. Yehuda Katz, who's somewhere back in the back, uh, probably writing angry articles about alias method chain, has been really, really helpful and wrote a couple of the really neat JavaScript features for it. Matthew Draper is our, uh, our Australian compatriot who's fixed 
every crashing bug that we found so far. And we're working with John Resig to get a browserless DOM working for things like Mechanize. And we think we're going to be at a place where that's really widely usable very quickly. So thank you very much. That's all we've got. <laughs> Except for this really disturbing picture. Uh, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer them now. Um, there's some scary bearded guy in the back, Yehuda. Oh, right. Um, he was suggesting that I talk about defined property. One of the nice things about having, um, having the extension language for the JavaScript runtime not be something like C is that we can try out new JavaScript features really easily by prototyping them in Ruby. Defined property is something that's going into the next release of JavaScript probably in, it's in Firefox 3.1, right, Yehuda? Okay, it's going in sometime soon, but we were able to very easily implement it in Ruby, try it out, experiment with the API, and see what worked best for it, which is really nice. You can, that's how we handle things like that. Stop to script up for those that would not cause all kinds of or object overloads. Yeah, it also lets us do things that JavaScript doesn't normally let you do, like mark functions as not being enumerable or read only or anything like that. Way in the back. I have a question and comment. Uh, my question is, would being able to write JavaScript and write through Ruby help with unfactoring? I'm sorry, could you speak up just a bit? Would being able to write JavaScript and write through Ruby help with unfactoring? I'm sending a microphone. Hold on. Unfactoring. Make your code harder to read. <laughs> He's making a joke. I don't have any problem making my code hard to read without multiple languages. Uh, for those of you who are cursed with the ability to write clear code, it could absolutely help you. And I'd be in favor of that. And my comment is, would you be interested in getting together with Ryan Davis and having a sprint to uh, flog your Johnson? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> in fact, Ryan and I regularly flog uh, Johnson together on Tuesday nights. <laughs> um, with regard to... Uh, memory usage? Memory um, usage? How big can Johnson get? <laughs> Johnson can get pretty big, but accurately estimating memory usage can be very hard. That's what she said. So, <laughs> I suggest that you play with your Johnson yourself and see how big you can get it. <laughs> right down here in front. Um, first, have you used Johnson with uh, TraceMonkey or any of the new JavaScript engines, which are immediately much faster? We have, but I wouldn't say we've done it really successfully. TraceMonkey, we pulled in because it's an API equivalent to SpiderMonkey, and it runs three times as slow and crashes a lot. But that's probably our usage patterns and not TraceMonkey's fault. I see. So we are working on that. We've looked at uh, Squirrelfish and JavaScript core. Um, they're a little more difficult to implement because the C APIs that we need aren't there. We need to reach a little further into the guts. So we're hoping that there's a better C API there. V8 uh, has a very good C++ API, and uh, our compatriot in Australia is working on that right now. The API for Johnson itself is runtime pluggable, so once we get those working, there shouldn't really be any outward-facing changes. And um, what... Could you potentially use Johnson for unit testing or integrating into your test suite various Ajax facilities so that uh, if you have a system that relies on Ajax very heavily, you could use Johnson to actually run those tests through JavaScript in the Ruby context? Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, we are, like I said, we're working with John Resig on env.js, which among other things has Ajax support in it. We have a couple versions of things like prototypes, unit test, um, framework, where we've pulled out all of the, uh, the browser-specific stuff, although we're looking for a little more clean of a JavaScript unit test framework. And uh, yeah, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't do that. In fact, I'd love to have that. If I could run auto test on my JavaScript, I would be extremely happy. Anything else? Uh, JavaScript requirements. Yes. Yeah, you can run as many as you want. All right, well, thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. We'll be up here. If you want to come up and ask any other questions or hack with us, please feel free. Thank you.